Good morning. I'm Paulette Patterson Dilworth, Vice President for Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion here at the University of Alabama at Birmingham. I'd like to take this opportunity to welcome you to our session today on promotion and tenure requirements in STEM departments. Our presenters today are Dr. Jeanette Jones from Alabama A&M University and Dr. Farah Lubin here at the University of Alabama. I, I will give an introduction uh, shortly, but I'd like to um, share some information with you regarding the advance, the Alabama Advanced Partnership for Gender Equity. This, this program was project was funded in fall of 2019 as part of the National Science Foundation's advanced program. And it is aimed at increasing the participation and advancement of women in science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. I'd like to acknowledge our partner institutions, which include Alabama A&M University, the University of Alabama at Huntsville, Oakwood University in Huntsville, Miles College, and the University of Alabama at Birmingham. And today we're very delighted to have two um, scholars with us who will talk to us about promotion and tenure in the STEM fields. Um, so our first speaker is Dr. Farah Lubin. Farah is an associate professor and director of the Neuroscience Roadmap Scholars Program here at the University of Alabama. She's an associate scientist in the Comprehensive Center for Healthy Aging and associate scientist in the Comprehensive Neuroscience Center. She received her undergraduate degree from Alabama State University in Montgomery, Alabama and her PhD in cell and molecular biology and immunology from Bingham, Binghamton University in Bingham, New York. She also worked as a research assistant at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center in New York. Dr. Lubin has completed two postdoctoral fellowships in molecular science, molecular neuroscience at Baylor College of Medicine in Houston, Texas, and most recently in the Department of Neurobiology at UAB. Dr. Lubin is a recipient of a Pathway to Independence Award from the National Institutes of Health and the FASCB Award. Our Second speaker is Dr. Jeanette Jones, who is a specialist in medical mycology, who serves as professor of biology at Alabama a and University. In addition to serving as president of the Faculty Senate, Dr. Jones is a thorough researcher committed to, and a committed educator and a resourceful leader mentor. After earning the bac baccalaureate degree from Fort Valley State University in Fort Valley, Georgia, she furthered her education by completing the requirements for master's and doctoral degrees at The Ohio State University in Botany and Medical Mycology. Throughout a phenomenal career of teaching, research, and service, she immersed herself in the awareness and promotion of the field of biology and pre-med among African Americans nationally, having also served as director of the Center for Biomedical, Behavioral, and Environmental Health Research. As an educator, she diligently taught such diverse subjects as biology, mycology, medical mycology, and introduction to health careers. Her impressive career also includes service as a higher education administrator and a university trustee. In her capacity as president of the Faculty Senate at Alabama a and University, Dr. Jones demonstrates unwavering commitment to the success and professional development of the faculty, as well as serving as an integral force in the ongoing achievement of hundreds of students seeking entry into STEM professions. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Lubin and Dr. Jones. Ladies. Okay, you're on. So am I first? Yes. <laughs> yes. Oh, okay, all right. Thank you very much. Um, I'm very pleased to be here today to share some comments that I have about promotion and tenure. As a faculty senate president, of course, this is one of our priorities to make sure that the faculty are uh, duly informed about the requirements. And so um, today I'm gonna share my comments and, and look forward to the questions that you may have. There are a couple of comments I, I do wanna mention uh, uh, as a part of the advanced program led by UAB. Uh, we have been focusing on women and, and uh, minorities. And so I just want to comment that although women uh, today comprise an increasing 
uh, a large proportion of science and engineering majors, the representation of women in leadership positions in academic institutions, scientific and professional societies and honorary organization is still low. It's very low relative to the number of women qualified to hold those positions. So uh, that was first stated in Beyond Bias and Various Report. And according to the National Academies Report, it is not the lack of talent, but rather the unintentional biases of, and outmoded institutional structures that are hindering the access and advancement of women and minorities in the STEM disciplines. So research and practice have also shown that mentoring can provide the support and encourage opportunities for retention and sustained advancement of women in sciences and biomedical careers. And so that's why uh, it has been very important to me as a, a faculty center president and as a member of, uh, of the sciences, a, a professor in the sciences to try to reach back. And one of, the, and one of the initiatives that we have at the university is a faculty mentoring program. And it's intended to do just what we're gonna talk about today. That's the promotion and tenure requirements in STEM. And so uh, I would like the, the first slide or the next slide. So we put together this presentation uh, from hiring to tenure and promotion. Because we feel that um, once you hire a faculty member, you have to start day one. Uh, and working with them. So what is required? Next slide. We can, we can sum it up now, tenure and promotion. You have to understand what is required at the university. Whatever university you're attending or where you're employed, what is required is unique to different universities. So you have to know what is required. Uh, you should also have a, a a program that mentors new faculty members at the time of their appointment, mentored them and placed them with experienced senior faculty who have a solid research and publications record. And the third thing is to pro provide the proper support for faculty to advance in their careers. Um, you can do that formally or informally. In the past, we've been doing it very informally, but now is, there is a trend to have former, a formal tenure and promotion training process at the various universities. And it should be aimed at removing any subtle gender, racial, and other biases that may be present. In some cases, incentives are provided for senior faculty to work with junior faculty. Next. So what do you need to know at your institution or your university? Uh, we feel that in order for you to know what to do, you have to have some idea of the culture. The culture of the various universities is different. It's unique to that institution. Uh, the culture is unique in terms of its history. It's unique in terms of its leadership and its mission and vision. Faculty should know what the mission of the institution is and what is the vision uh, so that you uh, know how you fit into that. And it, it is unique in its struggles and challenges. Of course, Alabama A&M has very unique uh, struggles and challenges. We are a historically black institution. We're a land grant institution, and we're we also an institution that was founded by an ex-slave. And so all of that's unique to Alabama A&M and uh, our mission and, and what we have done to uh, make a difference in the community. Uh, we're also unique in our successes and our victories, and we're very proud of those. Next. So every faculty member should have a copy of whatever strategic plan that you have. Uh, we should know uh, our strategic plan is into the future. In it, we describe our mission and our vision. So what does your career have to do with the mission of the university? So you can see how it, you tie into it. One of, we are center of excellence in our mission. We say that the university is dedicated to providing 
student-centered educational environments for, for the emergence of scholars, scientists, leaders, and critical thinkers. So how do you fit into that? You as a faculty member should have a role, uh, see that you have uh, a role in, in uh, realizing a mission for the university. The next thing and that we have, uh, the next slide please, is very critical is the faculty handbook. Um, one, one of the things I have uh, as a responsibility is directing the, um, the changes or any of kind of updates that we have in the faculty handbook. Book. That's led by a group of faculty appointed by the provost, but the faculty senate president is, uh, chairs that committee. So we look to make sure that the policies and procedures are clear, there's clarity in them, and it's, it's information that can be utilized by the faculty uh, that they understand. It. And so we update it uh, every year. And we make sure that faculty know where they can locate it. And I encourage them to print it and have it as a quick reference. The next thing faculty should know as they're trying to promote, um, get promotion and tenured. Next slide, please. They should know the university hierarchy. Uh, what's the flow of information? Where's the authority line? Where are they? And where do you fit as a faculty member? And so uh, a faculty member shouldn't be sitting at a university and not know the structure that they have at the university or where they should get or they can get information. It makes a difference. Next. And then of course, a faculty should be aware of the, the how they are being evaluated. Uh, a lot of times uh, faculty may uh, receive a evaluation at the end of the year. That is not the time to get the forms. The form should be, should be made aware of how you're gonna be evaluated the first day, uh, the first day of the beginning of the semester. Uh, each year faculty about evaluated on teaching, research, and service. And that's how you gain your promotion through, through your accomplishments in each of those areas. You should discuss those expectations with your supervisor immediately in, in, in the beginning of the semester, the fall semester. And you should begin documenting your activities. Uh, most of the time people don't take the time to to properly document those things that they are involved in. Any certificates, programs, flyers, media features, um, publications, recognitions, notes of appreciation, all that uh, faculty, junior faculty, new faculty should uh, collect those and keep those documentations on file. And they should maintain folders in each of the major categories in which uh, they will be judged in teaching, research, and service. Uh, that's the focus of Alabama a and That's our mission, teaching, research, and service. And you should have performance in each of those areas. So you obtain also each year uh, copies. I keep them on your computer, evaluations from your classes. And if there are weaknesses, you should discuss those. Or if you've been evaluated that year, and you've uh, been found to be short in any area, you should discuss those with your supervisor and plan to correct them. The next slide. Uh, you also should know that once you're employed at the university, it's not permanent. Uh, you are hired at the university. Uh, when you're hired, you are under probationary period of employment. Uh, so you, you're not there for life. Your colleagues, supervisors are evaluating you, your performance in the classroom with students and with your peers in your area and university-wide, you are being constantly evaluated. So you should take it from day one as a time for you to let your light shine and let everybody know who you are, what you can do. Next slide. So the pre-tenure process is, is uh, one that I make all faculty uh, senators are uh, convey that information in their departments. Um, you do have to go through a pre-tenure review process. It's designed to assist new tenure track faculty in determining their progress and preparedness toward earning tenure. 
uh, tenure is earned, is not granted. So you have to uh, make pro progress in that area. And uh, you assist them in identifying deficiencies in their performance that must be addressed prior to applying for tenure. So it's not something that you, just because you've been there a certain number of years that you're going to get tenure. You, you have to, it's based on performance. It occurs at, these are the things that occur at the beginning of the last designated probationary year period. It differs uh, for different universities. Uh, assistant professors are reviewed in their third year at AM, associates, professors, their second year, and professors, their first year. So these uh, guidelines for free tenure portfolio are consistent with what you would need for uh, your tenure. So you go through the pre-tenure process and then you go through the actual tenure process. So faculty in your area will let you know, oh, you're not on track, you're not ready to go up for tenure. And so that tells you, that alerts you that you need to do something different. Next. So what does the pre-tenure portfolio include? Portfolio include, it includes the following materials, the letter of application, evaluations from the various individuals. The weights are given to each of the three areas of faculty responsibility, that's teaching, research, and service. A curriculum vita, documentation in terms of whether you've been involved in your profession, in your learning society, uh, with at least three years minimum. Uh, so you just can't go out and join a professional society. You have to have been involved in that society for more than three years. And then teaching advisement and portfolio. We are about teaching our students and uh, making a difference in their lives. And so we look at what you're doing, how you're teaching, are you uh, effective in, uh, in your teaching strategies? And are you using uh, different methodologies uh, that are effective, uh, innovative, and so forth? And of course, we've all had to do that with remote learning. Uh, whether we were involved in it or not, we've been thrust into it. And so uh, we are doing some things differently. Next. Uh, continuing with the portfolio, you have to have proof of student advisement and mentoring practices and assess student learning. So that's all a part of what we do. A minimum of three scholarly products, whether they, uh, they should be refereed, juried, or peer reviewed. And you should have competitively funded grants where you are the primary author or principal investigator. I can't be the co-investigator or second or third. You have to be the primary author in order to get credit. So to get the full credit for those documents, those scholarly products. And we've had a lot of discussion about it, but um, uh, we feel that's very necessary in terms of, of a promotion and tenure uh, documentation. Of course, then H is evidence of having made a contribution to the university. Of course, you wouldn't be at a university where you're not doing significant work or service. So you can serve on, um, on committees, chair graduate thesis committees, and do other kinds of service activities at the university. Next slide. Then uh, if you've done all that stuff during your probationary period, then you're, you're ready to submit for tenure and promotion. And so this is what is required at our university for uh, promotion at the different levels. Uh, the, the thing that we want to, as you're looking at the slide, to be aware of is if you're not recommended for tenure, you will be given a notice that you will be entering your terminal year at the university, which simply means that you have one year to find another job and you'll work uh, but at the end, uh, you will receive a letter of termination. So faculty who are well-informed, they know from day one regarding the expectations and who formulate and implement a success plan at the beginning of their appointment with the university are usually successful in that quest for the, obtaining tenure and promotion. And so uh, that's why we have a formal mentoring program to make sure that 
faculty, new faculty, and junior faculty, they want that they would know what the requirements are. Next slide. So this is a list of uh, all of the materials that a successful application would contain. The application, recommendations, performance, evaluation, teaching effectiveness, scholarly contributions, research, publications, so forth, service documentation, documentation of service to the public, documentation of honors and award, documentation of membership and learned society, highest copies of your highest degree earned, copies of your transcript, documentation of interns, residency, teaching, research assistantship, and a current curriculum leader. So you know that you have a significant amount of documentation that you need to compile from day one. It is difficult to, to go back and try to accumulate that later on. So if we tell you day one what you're gonna need, then you can begin to accumulate that information. Next. And of course, if, if, if there is any reason like this pandemic, if there's any reason you are not prepared to submit your application for promotion to tenure, and you have a strong justification, you should write a letter to your immediate supervisor. That request will either be approved, and if it's approved, your supervisor will send it on to the dean, and it will then go to our provost who will make the final decision. Of course, there are individuals who have whose research labs and different things have been interrupted because we've been in a pandemic. And some may have been um, in isolation or on quarantine and so forth, and that has caused disruption. So as a faculty senate president, we made sure that we had a, a, something in place to, to protect the faculty. All right, next. The use of the tenure and promotion guidelines to achieve career goals. We think if you follow those guidelines and you follow the checklist, then you will be further develop yourself in whatever career you're in, you are seeking to have a career in, whether it's STEM, whether it's biomedical sciences or whatever, the guidelines are clear and the checklist really help, is very helpful. So we have a checklist for promotion to a associate professor, for promotion to assistant professor, associate professor and full professor. So that checklist is, is uh, used by the faculty as they're compiling the information. And as I'm giving presentations today, I give those to our junior and new faculty and they receive the checklist. And we tell them, this is what you're gonna be uh, judged by. And so use it, keep it and follow it. Next slide. Uh, in terms of scholarship, uh, we want to make just emphasize to we emphasize to the faculty uh, that uh, whatever they're doing should be in a recognized journal. Don't try to do anything for expediency. Uh, it should recognize versus fee based. There are so many predatory journals out there, and so you have to make sure that you don't get caught up in the trap of trying to publish something quickly and not uh, have it in a recognized journal because it will be rejected. Uh, it should be peer reviewed or refereed. Next. And then I encourage them to collaborate. Uh, you can achieve a lot by working with others. Uh, you get to know your colleagues and other disciplines. Uh, there may be opportunities to co author papers. Uh, there, you also may serve as a co principal investigator on grants and contracts or serve as a reviewer. So collaborating with your colleagues and with others at other universities uh, can help you as you develop your career in STEM and any other areas. Take advantage, the next slide please. Take advantage of the opportunities to develop as a scholar. You wanna volunteer your work uh, to work on committees in a department, attend seminars, the workshops, attend professional conferences and present papers, publish articles, serve as advisors, uh, participate in university-wide activities and try to meet new faculty. So these are all little things that you can do and 
you'd be surprised that just telling people or informing them, these are some of the things you need to focus on as you build um, your career or you develop yourself professionally. And we also in the next slide, in terms of policies for tenure and promotion, uh, we uh, encourage and I really stress that your faculty handbook is the best source of information regarding policies and procedures for promotion and tenure. You should not try to get the information by word of mouth from anyone. The policies and procedures will be the ones that are followed. And if you have questions, you should consult with your colleagues or supervisors who have served on promotion and tenure committees or with your faculty senate president. Uh, they should have all of the information, the real information. Uh, you don't wanna get information that someone thinks is, is correct and it may not be the correct information. So um, those are the comments I have about the whole process of policies, uh, promotion and tenure and the need to have a faculty mentoring program that would help to guide new and uh, junior faculty through the entire process so that you can uh, really have faculty who are on the proper track for achieving their career goals. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Jones. Um, we're gonna hold questions until the end. So Dr. Lubin, if you would go ahead. And by the way, uh, for those of you who are participating, um, feel free to post your questions in the chat or the Q&A box. Okay, well, thank you for um, having me today. Um, I will try to not reiterate uh, some of the points that Dr. Jones made, but mostly highlight um, areas of challenges where obtaining promotion and tenure can occur with new faculty. Um, so I have put together a series of slides um, leading to uh, uh, or highlighting some of the commonalities across uh, uh, institutions and medical institutions, as well as uh, uh, differences. I, and wherever I can, I will point those out. Um, so the first point I wanna make is here at UAB, uh, tenure uh, uh, track faculty uh, are required to show excellence or out, be outstanding in two areas and show excellence, of course, in three areas, um, which Dr. Jones mentioned, uh, research, teaching, and service. Um, Non-tenure tra uh, track faculty are required to show excellence uh, or be outstanding in one area for promotion. Uh, it's important to note that here at UAB and other institutions that promotion on the tenure earning track uh, from assistant to associate professor may be uncoupled. So you can go up for promotion and then later on for uh, you can request tenure. Um, uh, as Dr. Jones mentioned, it's very important for faculty to be familiar with uh, uh, the faculty handbook. And of course that's online for UAB and important to understand the guidelines um, for appointment promotion and tenure. And that's also on UAB's website. Um, so I wanted to take time to talk about each of the challenges that occur with obtaining promotion and tenure. Um, and uh, it's important to plan ahead. It's important to understand uh, what is required within your own department or within your school, what's required for promotion and tenure. Um, so one of the biggest challenges is planning out your career. In which areas are you gonna primarily start to focus in on? Um, it varies if you are in a research intensive uh, department versus a clinical department. So it's important to understand what is more valued by your departmental uh, uh, appointment, promotion and tenure committee, uh, APTC, and what traditionally has been um, the mark to land on for obtaining promotion and or tenure. Um, so career planning first, let's tackle that. So it's very important for you as faculty not to be sidetracked. Um, you're really excited to start your lab. Uh, you're really excited to work with colleagues. You're really excited to teach, whatever it might be, but it's important to first stay focused. 
And where do faculty often get sidetracked? It's at the independence phase, right? So you are now independent from your primary mentor. And so the challenge is that you have to change and, kind, and in some cases, pro primarily end that relationship to start showing independence from your uh, primary mentor before you became faculty. Um, timing of independence. It's important to uh, establish your independence early on. Um, and that can take place in many forms, whether you publish independently or you uh, start uh, uh, writing grants independent of your primary mentor. Um, it's important to form uh, new collaborations. So seek out new mentors. Um, uh, by seeking out new men mentors, as Dr. Jones pointed out, you will be able to find uh, people uh, that are independent of your primary mentor that can perhaps write a letter in support of your promotion or tenure. Uh, planning beyond first three year term, right? So oftentimes you're so focused in, if you're in a research intensive uh, department, setting up your lab uh, and if you if you have teaching responsibilities then perhaps setting up your curriculum um, or your uh, 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 your uh, course uh, syllabus and so all of that is time consuming and then training uh, students within your lab postdocs uh, research assistants and so on before you know it three years are up and, and you, you're, you're starting to start thinking about promotion. So it's, it's important to plan well beyond your three-year term uh, where you're first probably gonna have a pre-evaluation by your departmental APTC. Um, it's important to be visible outside the institution. So this is how you become, you begin to become uh, recognized as an independent entity with your own research program by basically going out and um, advertising for your own research program. So accepting lectures and seminars outside your in institution is vital towards expanding your research platform and showing that you're independent. Emphasizing quantity over quality of publication. So um, you may have come from a big name lab. Um, and so it's a matter of okay, do I publish in high impact journals only, which means that you probably take a, one, three years to publish one uh, paper versus, okay, I'm just going to do this in small chunks and publish uh, frequently and, more, and, 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 and increase the quantity of publications that I have, um, but making sure that, of course, your publications are, are of quality. And then writer's block right, analysis paralysis. So you have to set these internal uh, timelines for yourself and deadlines for yourself. Um, you must stay productive, you must consistently write. And um, I'll give you examples of how you can write that might not necessarily mean that you're always publishing a research article, but perhaps you could uh, publish a review article. There's different areas where you can uh, be productive. Um, it's also very important for you to be conscious of your percent effort in terms of how you're dividing your time across your, your main duties. Um, there, there are clinical departments at UAB as well as research intensive departments. And so your percent effort um, based on your role in, in each of those departments will be different. And so it's important to monitor your percent effort across those duties. So if you're focused uh, mostly on research and your research intensive lab, clearly this is where you're going, your percent effort is primarily gonna be distributed. Um, and in clinical practice, of course, you're gonna see more patients than uh, perform research or have percent effort in research. One of the things I like to highlight is um, service. So oftentimes um, as new faculty, especially those of diverse backgrounds, they tend to uh, be forced in the area of service uh, in terms of spreading out their percent effort. But it's important to remember that you have to know the culture of, your, of the department that you're in. And even though it makes you feel good to uh, perform service or have service activities, um, it's important to remember that the, the department is going to be, the departmental APTC is going to be evaluating you based on, for a research institution for, uh, department, for, for the example, um, research is more of a focus than service. 
um, and then perhaps second teaching. So be mindful of how you spread your percent effort. So publish and perish or perish, right? So um, how do you avoid the, the fatality of um, perishing, right? So as I uh, mentioned, you get a mentor, right? Um, so uh, Dr. Jones mentioned that mentoring is an, a vital aspect to your development as a, a faculty. Um, it's the same at UAB and it's the case for most institutions. It is highly advisable that you end up, you uh, formulate a mentoring uh, 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 committee or have a, a, a somehow a mentoring program that the department in, uh, uh, offers you so that you don't feel that you are um, not being held accountable. So the benefits of having a mentoring committee or a mentoring program is that you're being held accountable. You're being reminded of all the accomplishments that will get you to promotion and tenure. So this is all part of planning ahead. Um, networking and advocating for yourself. So oftentimes um, we all have this imposter syndrome, especially females and minorities. And there's this imposter syndrome. And I often say, even though it might be attributed to females and minorities, it is still very much the case that we all have it at every level. Everyone suffers from imposter syndrome, but it's important to advocate for yourself. It's important to speak up and, um, and, and let people know what you're doing and what you're working on. You never know what the fruits of networking might yield. Um, collaborations, um, definitely collaborate, but understand your level of commitment because you could collaborate and end up taking your percent effort away from your own research program because you're so involved with so many other projects that are not your own. So remember to consider your contribution. Um, set and keep timelines. And again, this is important for publication. You have to be mindful of deadlines. And sometimes you don't have deadlines and so hard deadlines. So you have to remember to set them for yourself. Different areas where you can publish. So most often we're familiar with the area of discovery where you go and do the research, whether it's basic or clinical research, and then you publish this new uh, research. This is the area we primarily focus on. But there are other um, areas of scholarship for publishing. So integration, you can interpret the use of knowledge across disciplines, and then you could prepare a comprehensive literature review. So uh, publishing in terms of writing a publication, a review publication is, is totally, absolutely okay, especially if the research is, go, the discovery is going a little slow, but try to also not be trapped in this um, scholarship of integration because you could end up pub publishing a bunch of reviews and very little research articles. So, so you have to keep a balance. Um, the third area is application. So aid society and professions in addressing pro pro uh, problems. So um, if you assume a leadership role in a professional organization or you're fostering professional growth. So basically, if you um, have a training grant and you publish results, um, success from the, um, uh, that training grant and how you're pushing students ahead, um, that's an area where you could actually uh, publish your results in. So that's application. And very few people t seem to remember that when you they tend to categorize training grants as service um, more so than, than anything else, but you could certainly uh, uh, publish in those areas. And then there's teaching. So study teaching models, practices and act, achieve optimal learning. Um, so you could publish on theories of teaching and what works best in your classroom. Um, so those are areas where you could publish in as well. Funding, funding, funding. It is absolutely vital that you understand the operational budget of your institution and subsequently your department. Where do the dollars flow? And where the dollars flow is where the priorities are made, right? So if um, more monies are coming from grants or clinical, um, those are where you're going to spend per your majority percent effort. This is what is being valued because that's where the money is. Um, the other part is the orange sliver, and that may involve teaching um, and service. You notice it's pretty small. 
Um, so being at a research inten intensive institution, you really should understand um, the budgeting val uh, uh, the budgeting that occurs uh, for a, a specific department, and um, that that reminds you of where the value is. Um, promotion and balancing service commitments. Again, the trap of service. Um, please try to avoid that. Uh, so promotion, yes, this is where you show excellence, uh, but promotion doesn't necessarily mean that scholarship is equal to citizenship, right? Um, so scholarship is teaching, service, uh, research, and creative activities, right? So creative uh, activities may involve getting uh, patents and so on, uh, but these areas are where you show uh, excellence and scholarship. And then the progression, um, such as promotion, is a requirement of tenure earning track, right? So you can't uh, earn tenure as an instructor or as an assistant professor. It's, uh, well, so it's when you go from assistant to associate that you can become tenure earning and earn tenure in that way. Um, effectiveness of teaching. So uh, your ability to develop effective curriculum materials organize and effectively present coursework, motivate student interest and participation, contribute significantly to the academic progress of students. All of this is effectiveness as a teacher, and this can take place uh, formally as well as informally. Informally, it can take place in the context of you teaching um, at the bench in your lab or serving on student committees and so on. Um, so just be mindful that it could be formal and informal. Core elements of effectiveness and service. So service is easiest to document. Oftentimes, if you just have a, a documentation that you participated or you have membership in an organization, that's very easy to document. The other areas in terms of research and teaching, you really have to be mindful about um, or in some ways creative about how you document your research and teaching activities. Some are op, op, more obvious than others. So service functions can be performed at um, any, uh, directly at UAB or uh, uh, regionally, nationally, or internationally. So um, again, documentation matters. So hold on to your service certificates, hold on to your letters, thanking you for your service and so on. All of those are documentation um, that you would need to demonstrate service. Um, service may include such activities as participation in committee work. Um, again, uh, a lot of uh, women and, uh, and minorities uh, fall into the trap of always having to serve on committees because they always need to have uh, check the box female minority on their committees. So be very mindful about what committees you choose to work um, on. Fulfillment of administrative assignments, um, contributions to the improvement of student and faculty life, faculty consultation within and outside UAB. Again, make sure that's documented. And then of course, professional service. Again, with service, be mindful of your percent effort that you're allocating towards service because your department has a certain culture. And so you have to be mindful of it. Um, but remember effectiveness, not excellence. So you have to be effective at service, not necessarily excellent, believe it or not. Um, demonstration of scholarly research. So you have to publish, you have to, uh, present um, at different uh, uh, meetings, um, uh, nationally and internationally, give seminars at um, different institutions. And again, I mentioned you could try to develop patents. Um, that's definitely effectiveness um, at the research level. Um, assessment should include quality of the individual's um, scholarly approach. So definitely the, the research articles that you publish, are they of good quality? capacity for independent thought. That means that you've been without your mentor for quite a while and you've demonstrated that you could think um, independently um, outside of um, your mentor. Um, originality and products of scholarship. So again, pub publish, publish, publish. Um, so these areas, of course, um, vary extensively by institution. 
So that's why it's very important for you to understand the culture of your department. If you don't understand what has been traditionally considered to be um, scholarship in research, teaching, or service activities, then you might just end up focusing too much on teaching or too much on service and not enough on research when your department has uh, traditionally demonstrated that research is what's valuable. Um, building recognition, so teaching, uh, develop topical sessions for societies, meetings, publish on teaching innovation, get invited to present. So if you have a friend at an institution say, you know, hey, I'll love to come for a visit, but can I get on your seminar uh, speaker list? Um, uh, service, national committees, uh, leadership um, at the society level, uh, committee chairs. Um, oftentimes you try to avoid serving as chair early on um, as an, as an uh, instructor or assistant professor because that's very time consuming. So again, um, be mindful of the percent effort and contribution that you need to put into uh, uh, any service activities. Um, editorial boards, um, that can also fall on um, in terms of research. Um, so sometimes um, service and teaching can overlap and then uh, research and service activities, they can also overlap. You can claim, you can claim them uh, in both areas. If you're, for example, a um, uh, 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 committee chair, but then you are, sorry, editorial board, um, and then you're, you're, that's a service, of course, um, but you, can, you could also uh, have this under um, research activities because you're an editor for uh, a major journal or something like that. So that can be considered having um, national and international recognition, and you could also list it under research activities. So important to highlight, tenure um, is not awarded merely on the basis of time in service. Absolutely not. It is awarded upon evidence of capacity and likelihood for continued um, intellectual, scholarly, and professional vitality, a sense of responsibility and dedication to make the the continuing exemplary performance of duties a reasonable expectation. So it is expected that the, the level of performance that you have for promotion or you've demonstrated for promotion is sustainable. Can, can we expect or can UAB expect from you that you will maintain this level of performance? Um, uh, the award of tenure is a reflection of demonstrated excellence in two of the three um, areas, service, teaching, and research, recognition by your peers, and prediction of long-term sustainability. So you have to keep it going. Um, so here are some of the problems that are that occur with um, promotion obtaining or lack thereof failure to obtain promotion and tenure. So uh, letters of recommendation. So I'll just point out some of the things here. Um, there's inconsistencies between emphasis of letter and areas of excellence being claimed, right? So make sure that whoever you're uh, uh, rec or asking or listing for to give recommendations to your promotion and tenure that they are on the same page as you. They know where, where, um, where you're most um, vital or have demonstrated um, excellence. Um, letters from non-academic institutions of private practice, those, those are not um, uh, adequate. Um, so again, make sure that you're getting letters from appropriate individuals and institutions. Um, timing of promotion and tenure, sometimes you're being put up too quickly um, with departments with APTC uh, uh, com or APT committees. This is usually not the case because the APT committee won't allow this to happen and the chair most likely will not do this, but there are some departments uh, or faculty that think that they're ready earlier um, and, and when they're not. Um, so it's important to have approval from your um, APTC um, and then if you have disapproval from your APTC, then you're most likely not going to be approved by the faculty council. Um, the way your packet is organized. Again, get examples of how packets are, are put together. 
Um, if they're of poor quality and poor documentation, uh, then you're most likely just going to be rejected by the faculty council. So you, you want to put your best foot forward, in other words. Other problems are um, research success. You don't have enough manuscripts. You don't have enough grant funding or demonstrated uh, 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 that you've uh, successfully received funding continuously. Uh, paucity of first author publications. So some departments, they are focused on first author publications, other departments, senior author publications, but again, you're not producing well. So research success is not being demonstrated. Teaching su success is not demonstrated. Paucity of publications, uh, lack of directing courses, uh, service commitments. You, you haven't proven that you really are um, excellent in um, your scholarship and service. And again, um, helpful hints, uh, maintain a good CV, start early doc with your documentation. Uh, definitely a great idea to create a uh, portfolio. You could just have a folder on your desktop and you could just drag things into that folder. Um, and if you need help to try to organize yourself, but definitely start collecting material early on. And then um, have someone uh, critique your uh, uh, promotions and tenure package. Have uh, hopefully it's a mentoring committee that can do that. Or, and then sometimes um, the School of Medicine will um, uh, well, your department should um, offer pre-promotion um, uh, evaluation. Um, and then definitely you could review examples. So UAB has uh, on their website um, helpful hints and um, examples that you can follow of successful um, um, packages that have been put together. So with that, I'm happy to take any questions. Um, both Dr. Jones will be happy to take questions. We can't hear you, Dr. Doerth. You're muted. Thank you. Um, so there are no questions posted in the Q&A at the moment. But one of the things that comes to mind as I listen to both of your presentations has to do with um, this idea of traditional approaches um, that most departments in STEM continue to hold on to. One of our speakers earlier, um, Dr. Malcolm talked about um, part of the, some of the reasons why it has been difficult to increase the representation of women in these fields. Um, what are your thoughts about um, ways in which um, departments can do more to um, sort of make, um, I guess, the departments more receptive to being less traditional, but take into account that there are certain ways now that we can think about what makes for a better opportunity for women to advance. Well, I, I think uh, one of the problems we have is we spend a lot of time in recruiting uh, and trying to get talented uh, individuals, uh, minorities and women, but we don't uh, spend enough time to keep them. And, mm -hmm. and um, what I mean by that is some, when we bring them on board, and that's why I emphasize that uh, they need a mentor day one, uh, someone to uh, work with them. Because, uh, and Dr. Lupin had it on her slide, they can get, you can get off track so quickly. Mm. And before you know it, it's three years and you have to go up for pre-tenure. Mm -hmm. And you spend all your time with all the classes, advising all the students, and you haven't focused on the things that you need to focus on in terms of getting tenure or in, in maintaining a position. So that tenure process is very important to get those significant research activities and, and publications, get them, and you can fall behind so quickly. So, and then you're pressed um, in, in case of women, they have to have that work-life balance mm -hmm. and, and all of that, all of those things are factors. And so that's why I talked about these structures that we have at universities, that we really need to look at them because women are mostly affected by 
-hmm. the current structures in. We have uh, females in, in science department that may be the only female. And that person tends to get all of those, those committee assignments that are that, uh, things that department has to be engaged in. But why should that person, that female, have to do all of those things? Mm -hmm and the recruitment of students, advising the students and so forth. So they're overloaded. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we have to look at ways of balancing that. And uh, in, in our mentoring program, we had a, a, an individual development plan. And one of the questions we asked, what is it that you're doing that you don't want to do? Mm -hmm. And that was one of the things too many committee assignments, mm -hmm. advising too many students. Mm -hmm. And so I think we have to look at look at those things. I, I agree with you, Dr. Jones. And I think that um, this is why I kept emphasizing to be mindful of where your, your percent effort in terms of your activities are being spread. And I think that women um, should be uh, protected. Um, and, I, and I emphasize that you don't want to be committee chair, for example, on your first year that that's just so much work. So if you actually were to evaluate your percent effort with all your activities, then you would be less likely to fall into those, those service traps. Um, so I think that um, in order to change the culture, the chair, it starts at the top. The chair should change um, the culture, right? Mm -hmm. so, so the chair would set the tone where your incoming faculty is protected from mm -hmm. certain activities. Um, tra traditionally, at least with our department, uh, uh, new faculty are protected from teaching mm -hmm. so that they don't, they could just focus on building their research program. And so the first or second year, they're not required to teach as much um, as, uh, as other faculty. So you have to give uh, enough room, running room mm -hmm. uh, for a, a a woman faculty or any new faculty to basically get their 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 sea legs, if you will, right? Um, that they are able to adjust to this new environment because it's a lot coming at you all at once. Mm -hmm. So there is one question, and we actually have time for this one question. Could you please explain the concept of jury versus non-jury contribution? I think we were just really talking about in the humanities and music and art, where you may have, you have a review of what, um, what the faculty members are doing in terms of that, uh, as opposed to um, having a publication that's being reviewed by a scientific panel. Mm -hmm. And so you're going up in a different discipline. Um, in terms of a review of the quality of your uh, work, whether it's uh, your art or whether it's your music or whether it's um, some of your, you know, the, the arts, the, I'm, I'm thinking about ceramics <laughs> and some of the other things that are reviewed. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So we are actually um, out of time, but I wanted, before we close this out, I wanted to ask both of our panelists if there's one um, comment or statement that you'd like to leave uh, for the participants um, that you didn't get a chance to share or something that you thought about as far as just leaving them with a message. Um, I think I, I mentioned this, but I want to emphasize again that it's important. So. Um, uh, promotion and tenure at different institutions is like a moving target. Mm -hmm. And so it's important for you to understand what, uh, what the requirements are for obtaining promotion and tenure and to put your effort or um, your activities towards those areas um, and to not fall into the trap of um, always doing so much on the service end. I always tell anyone that I'm mentoring or talking about obtaining promotion and tenure is that uh, you will always have an opportunity to, to perform service. Mm -hmm. But remember first, you wanna get all that's required for promotion first, mm -hmm. right? Um, what's valued the most and definitely understanding how your department allocates funds 
Mm -hmm. um, is helpful because then you, you can understand why there's such a push for write more grants, write, uh, do publication, so forth. So the operating budget of your department and understanding how that works, and then you realize it's not personal, it's business. So uh, it's important. I mean, it, the service part is feel good, but don't get trapped into uh, doing too much on that end. Great, thank you. And I just like to leave what I said on the first slide. Uh, and that is to understand what is required at your university, mm -hmm. what is required and to write it down, uh, uh, put it somewhere that you can see it and you can uh, focus on it every day, what the requirements are. Mm -hmm. Then to secure a mentor. If the university doesn't have a formal program, a mentoring program will just seek out a, a mentor, someone uh, who you can work with and a person who will talk with you very openly and, and guide you through your career. Right. And then lastly, is try to get the support, uh, the kind of support you need. Um, well, it's just emotional support um, and financial support to seek it out. So because you're going to need both of those uh, as you uh, develop uh, professionally in your career. Well, thank you both very much. And really, we really appreciate you for uh, sharing with us today. And I'd like to remind our participants that our next um, session will be January 14th at 12 noon. And our speaker for that session will be Dr. Esther Siswam, who's with Miles College. And she is a professor in the Department of Natural Sciences and Mathematics. And the topic for that session will be focused on balancing work and family life. Awesome. So thank you all again. And I look forward to seeing you at the next session. Have a good afternoon. Bye, Bye everyone. Bye. 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 Thank you so much. Bye.